Anthony. I know a lot of our referral group is really familiar with your work at, at TLC, with LASIK, PRK. But for over a decade, we've been offering ICL at, at eye surgeons, uh, another type of refractive surgery. Who's a good candidate for that um, as far as who our optometrists should be looking for to potentially be helped by this procedure? Yeah, that's a good point, Damon. Uh, I think that when most people think about laser, vi or when most people think about vision correction, they think about laser vision correction. And what a fake eye well does is act on an entirely different part. Uh, we instead of working on the cornea, we're working inside the front part of the eye. We're working in the anterior chamber. Uh, the best candidates are those with a strong desire to get less dependent on their glasses and contact lenses. So a similar set of candidates uh, as with LASIK, really. The best candidates for phacic eye oil placement are those who are 21 to 45 years old. The Vision ICL is manufactured in powers of up to minus 16 diopters, but we often treat patients with prescriptions higher than that for the reduction of their myopia. The TORIC model of the ICL treats patients with up to four diopters of astigmatism. Just as with LASIK and PRK, a stable refraction is desired for the best outcomes. An anterior chamber depth of three millimeters is required to allow for safe placement of the ICL. A healthy endothelial cell layer is required for implantation. Anterior chamber measurements and endothelial cell imaging are done at eye surgeons at the screening exam. Finally, many of the best candidates for fake IOLs have been told that they are not good candidates for LASIK or PRK. So we talked about myopia with astigmatism, especially those that are minus eight, maybe patients with thinner corneal pachymetry. Uh, these are good candidates uh, for ICL. What would a patient expect in terms of a visual outcome? What do they describe to you after the surgery? Yeah, so these are patients that start with large amounts of nearsightedness, high amounts of amotropia. So the wow factor is impressive. Um, these are patients that's, that um, get better just as fast as our LASIK patients get better. Uh, we hear comments uh, as the patients are being wheeled out of the operating room and out of the ambulatory surgery center about the, the quality of their vision and, and the speed with which they recover. Uh, ultimately, they should have uh, the same LASIK-like visual outcomes. Um, and in fact, for higher amounts of nearsightedness, minus 8, minus 10, minus 12, and 14, where LASIK can struggle a little bit. Uh, this is really the space where phacic eye will shine. This is where the quality of the vision does not drop off uh, like it might with keratorefractive surgeries. So we know um, ICL is going to be working inside the eye versus LASIK PRK is on the cornea. What sort of anatomical things should we be looking for? Who's a candidate? And then what are we going to see after the surgery with this uh, implant? There are some very specific criteria uh, that we uh, follow, FDA guidelines. And most of the time, we really need to measure these in our clinic. Uh, a crowded anterior chamber is a difficult spot to put a fake guy well. But uh, thankfully, most of these high myopes have larger anterior chambers and have uh, plenty of room for a fake guy well. Uh, we determine the space uh, requirements, anterior chamber depths uh, on, uh, the day of, uh, or on the day of the consultation. They should expect a surgery done uh, sequentially uh, on different days, but close together. Most frequently, we do them one day and then the very next day. Uh, they should expect um, a, a rapid recovery of their vision. As an optometrist, um, what you should expect to see is, is perhaps a difficult time even seeing the fake eye. Well, these things are crystal clear. They're very thin. Uh, in the center, they're as thin as 40 microns. Uh, they have a myopic uh, uh, lens to them, obviously. So it can be tough to see the very thin central uh, lens portion. A dilated examination reveals the lens uh, clearly. Patients get uh, a laser iridotomy. Uh, so if you look for a laser iridotomy, you should see a patent laser iridotomy. Uh, the lens has the potential to block the natural flow of aqueous within the anterior chamber. 
so that this doesn't cause problems. Uh, Preoperatively, we use uh, YAG laser to place a superior laser iridotomy there. So if you look carefully, you'll see that it's a small but patent iridotomy. So Anthony, with ICL, if you're going to do surgery back to back, maybe on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. We're going to see them in our clinic on Thursday and then typically make the handoff to a referring doctor for co-management at that point. Uh, they'll see the patient in a week, a month, three months. What does the drop schedule look like? Is there anything we should be looking out for in terms of complications or what are some pearls you have for our referring doctors? Right. So uh, I think the, the pearls I would start with first, um, these are patients whose lives have been changed and, and changed in, in ways that are that I try to understand, but I'm not sure I can really gather the significance. So I would say be um, enthusiastic, be happy for them, share in the joy that they have with these fake guidelines. Uh, the drop schedule, um, we've uh, engineered um, to be very, very similar to our cataract surgery drops. They get an an a combined, most of the time, a combined drop that combines an antibiotic, a steroid, and a non-steroidal in a single drop. We set out a tapering schedule for them that looks, uh, in most cases, identical to a cataract drop. So it ought to be something familiar to you and, and easy to follow. Uh, the examination postoperatively um, is focused on the anterior chamber. Uh, we expect to see a clear cornea. We expect to see a relatively quiet anterior chamber. We expect to see a round pupil. Uh, sometimes a small amount of myocol is given uh, at the end of the case. So uh, it wouldn't be unexpected to see a, a small pupil if you saw the patient the day after, um, the, day after the procedure. Uh, if you look carefully, you should be able to detect the ICL. It's very thin and very clear, uh, but there's often a space that can be realized between the ICL itself and the anterior lens surface. So looking carefully at that space um, is important. We want to see some offset of the lens from the uh, anterior crystalline lens surface. We're looking at a phagic IOL one day post-operative visit. What you'll notice right away, the eye is relatively quiet. There is minimal to sometimes even no inflammation post-operatively. What's most important for us to determine is the vaulting of the IOL over the natural crystalline lens. I've found that it's best to view this by angling our slip beam at approximately 30 to 45 degrees to assess the vault. I'm looking first at the posterior surface of the IOL vaulting above the anterior surface of the natural crystalline lens. And the vault is the space, the black area here, between these two surfaces. What is considered to be acceptable vault is between 50 to 200% of our benchmark. The benchmark I think of is the corneal thickness. So if you think of a cornea being approximately 500 microns, maybe that's slightly on the thinner side, 50% of that to 200% of that benchmark would be appropriate. If you have excess vaults, you're concerned about the lens contacting the iris, leading to iris chafing, which can lead to some complications. In comparison, if the lens is too flat, the lens could come into contact with the anterior surface of the natural crystalline lens, leading to an early cataract development. So postoperatively, there are three things we're looking for here. Number one, we want to assure minimal to no inflammation in the eye. We want to assure normal IOP, and we want to assure appropriate IOL vault.